Now we move to the next speaker, um, who is Rory Bingham and Chris Hughes. It's fine. Well, I'm just Rory Bingham. Not yes, good, yes. We, we've already seen Chris. Chris, do you want to do half the talk with me? <laughs> uh, um, he's going to talk about sea level signature of the Atlantic Meridian and over telling circulation. Okay, so now we move from the Pacific into um, where we prefer over here in Europe, which is the Atlantic. It's the most important place to us. Um, just joking. Um, okay, so I shouldn't really start a serious scientific talk with a cartoon like this, but nonetheless it illustrates the point. Um, this is um, the, thermo the, the ocean's 3D thermohaline circulation, or commonly called the global conveyor belt, as a, just to add to the fun of the situation. Um, basically, the part we're going to concentrate on in this talk is the Atlantic part, where you've got warm surface waters travelling north, releasing heat into the atmosphere as it does so, and getting cold and then sinking and then returning and gradually upwelling in other parts of the ocean. <coughs> Uh, this is, um, um, in recent, recent years, I guess, we've become concerned about the stability of the overturning circulation, the, the global conveyor belt, um, from um, paleo observations and also um, from model observations. This is shown um, uh, an experiment done at the Hadley Centre, the Hadley CM3 model, that um, in a warming climate, melting of the Greenland ice sheet could possibly um, shut down the overturning circulation and um, have a drastic impact on um, global temperature and, and climate generally. <clears throat> so if we translate this um, cartoon to what we actually see in uh, an ocean model, of course we can't do this calculation for the real world, there's not sufficient observations, but we can do this in the model. And basically this is the zonally integrated um, transport at each um, model level and at each latitude and then you can calculate the overturning stream function. So we see here, here this, the um, um, warm surface there down to about 1,000 metres travelling north, cooling, and then returning in the intermediate there from about 1,000 to 3,000 metres. And then you've got a sort of a, a counterclockwise, um, much weaker circulation beneath that. <clears throat> so if we take the top 1,000 metres, well, actually, um, 100, we, we, we neglect the very surface there because we don't want the equine transport bit. We want the, just the geostrophic flow. So we take the, the we integrate this um, from 100 down to um, 1,000 metres, and we end up with a pattern like this. This is the, so we see here in the North Atlantic uh, a gradual, um, this, this is time here, going from the start of the model run, which was 19, um, sorry, 1984 to 2004, we see um, a gradual increase in the strength of the overturning in the uh, North Atlantic um, and up to about the mid-90s and then a gradual decrease. So we want to try and understand the processes which are driving that and how they might impact on, on um, um, bottom pressure and then on to sea level. So <coughs> beneath the Ekman layer, we see that actually the zonally integrated transport is given by a very simple relationship between the, just the difference really between the pressure on the eastern boundary and the pressure on the western boundary. Um, this is here um, a cross section looking north through the model topography at um, 42 degrees north. So you can see we've got um, in the upper layer, basically it is really just the difference between the pressure on the west and the pressure on the east. Um, at lower levels you get intervening topography but um, our analysis shows that they, we can really neglect these. In fact, we can actually neglect um, the eastern pressure as well for interannual variability. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. Um, you can effectively say it, set it to zero and then determine the, pre the, the transport um, just from the pressure on the western boundary. So to get an increase in the flow, we saw that increasing towards the mid-90s and then a decrease. That increase should be associated with a decrease in pressure in the, on the upper part of the boundary and a increase in pressure on the lower part of the boundary. <clears throat> And this is um, the calculation, this is the reconstruction of based, on, based on that geostrophic relationship, sitting, setting the eastern boundary pressure to zero just from using the western boundary pressure in the model. So we can, we can reconstruct the, the intraannual variability very, very well just using the pressure on the western boundary. We can neglect um, the, pr the pressure on the eastern boundary. <coughs> this seems to be quite a general result. So taking a very different model, the Hadzium 3 model, a much lower resolution model, we get exactly the same thing. We can neglect the eastern boundary pressure and we can reconstruct it just using the western boundary pressure. I've also looked at this in a very high resolution version of Ockham, the one that Chris showed earlier, 12th of degree. We get the same thing and also other models have looked at. So either all models seem to get this wrong or this is what really happens in reality. If we want to reconstruct the intraannual variability overturning, we can just concentrate on looking at the western boundary pressure. 
So this is the leading EOF of um, intra-angle bottom pressure in the Ockham model that I was looking at, which is the quarter degree version. So we can see this is the, um, the, the um, pattern here, it's a very neat pattern actually, and we can see high pressure, um, sorry, a decrease in pressure as we'd expect in the upper part on the shelf, and that contour there is at 1300 meters, and then beneath that we get a decrease in the pressure, which is exactly what we'd expect from a, um, an a increase in the overturning and then a gradual, um, and then from the mid-90s onwards, we get the, in, the pressure increasing in the upper part of the boundary and decreasing on the lower part, which corresponds to the, um, to the gradual weakening again of the circulation. And we can see that there, the very um, close correspondence between the two things. Um, I think Chris alluded to this um, a little bit. In the deep ocean, this really shows how similar the correspondence between sea level and bottom pressure um, according to time, to, to, to frequency. So we see at um, high frequencies, in the deep ocean, this is in red here, and this is the shallow part but, um, in blue. For high frequencies, um, bottom pressure and sea level are very similar, whether you're in the deep water or in the shallow water. But as you move to, in the deep water, as we move to longer frequencies, lower, lower frequencies, we see that they become decoupled from each other and they become um, separated. But that doesn't happen on the, on the um, upper part of the water column above 1,000 metres. They seem to, they stay, or they're persistently coupled even out to long frequencies. So, we can therefore expect, and we do actually find, um, this um, leading EOF of bottom pressure here um, is also, um, and this is the leading EOF of sea level um, focused in on this region, and these, these are the principal components. So you see that they actually do follow each other very, very closely. Um, this shows the percentage of variance accounted for. So we can see for, the, um, for both patterns, they account for a large percentage of the variance on the shelf. So if we see that there's a good relationship between the strength of the overturning and pressure, we can also expect there to be a relationship between the strength of the overturning and sea level along the US east coast. And in fact, this is just looking at the plotting um, sea level anomaly against the upper layer transport. So we can see there is actually is a very linear trend between them with a slope of minus 0.59. Um, so that means that for every um, sphere drop increase in the strength of the overturning, sea level on the, eastern, on the western boundary or the eastern coast of the US will drop by two centimetres and conversely the other way around. Um, and this shows the, um, the actual transport and the transport based on this sea level re re regression. You can see that it actually does um, account for most of the variability. So that's, um, so far we've been looking at model. So how does this compare to the reality? Of course, reality is never quite as simple as models, and that's why I generally like to stick to models, because they're a lot easier to do. But uh, um, if, we, if we do the same EOF analysis of the um, altimetry data, we do see, as I said, it's more messy, but we do see this top topography, um, sorry, bathymetry constrained pattern with um, um, a, a large signal on the shelf, which extends into the deeper ocean here, and we can also see that it accounts for quite a lot of the variance, not nearly as nicely as it does in the model, but it still accounts for quite a substantial part of the variance on the shelf. <coughs> so then going from altimetry to tide gauges, we looked at these tides, tide gauges here, which run from um, Atlantic City, which I'm very familiar now with from um, that uh, TV series, Boardwalk Empire, um, to um, St. John's, Newfoundland here. And this, is, this, this solid red line is the leading EOF pattern and the dashed line is the percentage of the variance accounted for. So we can see that coherent mode accounts for over 80% of the variance from Atlantic City up to um, somewhere around New York area. <coughs> and those are the ones shown in, in black here, that, um, black triangles, that doesn't come out very well. These here are the principal components. So in blue is what we saw in, in the um, model, and this is what we see from altimetry and in green, and this is what we get from the tide gauges. Ideally, we want to look at the tide, tide gauges. Obviously, they go back further. Um, and you can see that they correspond quite well. And one thing you do see here is a, an abrupt ju jump in coastal sea level between 1994 and, a, um, and 1996 of about five centimetres. That would, if we, tr if we take our relationship between sea level and meridian overturning circulation, that would correspond to a, a, um, a slowdown of about two and a half sphere drops briefly for that period. So um, this is um, taking the tide gauge record, the ones that count for over 80% of the variance, and going back to, um, well, um, just before 1950, 
you can see that the, and this is New York to Yarmouth here, you can see there's a high degree of correspondence between them. So we just basically added those up to form a composite. And we took that as a, um, based on our regression analysis of a um, two centimetres for one sphere drop relationship as um, a possible indicator of the likely range of past MOC variability. Um, we see that there's a basically a standard deviation of about 1.25 sphere drops and with fluctuations of up to five, um, five sphere drops. Obviously, there's not going to, the MSC is not going to be the only thing affecting sea level, so this shouldn't be taken that every single fluctuation here is a reflection of a fluctuation in the MSC, but this should set a, an upper bound, if you like, on the variability of the MSC going back you know, over 50 years. Um, I'm now going to move to look at uh, um, um, the, um, the MSC variability in another model. This is ORCA, um, it's a quarter degree model, and it's a control run. Um, no simulation of any data from 1950 to 2004. And this is the upper layer transport. And I'm now looking over the whole range of latitudes from minus 30 up to 60 degrees. And I thought it appropriate, given the follow-on meeting, to consider how that um, variability projects itself onto the gloss tide gauge network in the model. So <coughs> this is basically um, all the gloss tide gauges, um, this actually doesn't really, it almost corresponds to the ID of the tide gauges, but it's just the number in the sequence, it's just their position in the sequence of um, tide gauges as they came out, as they, as they came off the website. Um, but roughly speaking, you, you go clockwise around the Indi rim of the Indian Ocean, clockwise around the rim of the Pacific Ocean, and then up through the Atlantic on the western boundary, down the eastern boundary, and these are other places over here. But <clears throat> luckily what we, and, and this, is the, um, this is the transport, this is every latitude, the skill corresponds to the skill of the transport reconstruction based on the linear regression between the sea level at the tide gauge and the, and the transport. So we see, luckily, because um, it would have been a bit worried if this high skill was right over here in the Indian Ocean or in the Pacific Ocean, we see a high degree of skill um, in terms of the re relationship between um, sea, coastal sea level at tide gauge stations in the Atlantic and the strength of the overturning. And we see that gradually as we move further north, um, the, the tide gauges also move further north, as we'd expect. <clears throat> so this is the, the skill of the best transport reconstruction based on sea level at each latitude. So we can see we go from, a lot of it is above 70% um, skill. Um, the lowest one here is at 15, where it drops down to 0.4. But again, we get very high skill up here. This corresponds to 55 degrees north. Basically, this is saying that most of the variability at a lot of these tide gauge stations is driven by MSC variability. So what I've done here, I've um, took the, um, the tide gauge, which gave the be best skill at any particular latitude, and plotted it on this, on this map here. And these, this color bar here corresponds to the tide gauge, which gives the greatest skill within that range. So basically, we say here between 30 degrees um, south and the equator, um, this Brazilian tide gauge, which I uh, find quite hard to pronounce, Ita Perica, is that right? Um, gives the greatest um, um, skill in recovering the transport within this range of latitudes. Um, the highest one is at nought degree, at the equator, where it accounts for 73% of the skill. Um, <coughs> most of them correspond to um, the tide gauge gives the best skill closest to where, it, where that, um, um, within that range of the um, latitudes. The only odd one is here, where you've got um, the variability of the MSC at five degrees north is um, given, reconstructed um, the best by the tide gauge here at Rio de, Rio de Janeiro um, with a skill of 72%. The best one overall is at St. John's here and it, it gives the variability at 50 degrees north with a skill of 77%, which is quite high, I think. Um, and this is just an um, example of the, the, this is just the time series here. So the actual um, transport at 50 degrees north is given in red, and we see from um, 19, 1960 a gradual increase to about I don't know, 1985, somewhere around there, and then a, a sharp drop off throughout the 90s up to 2004. And the reconstruction based on the sea level at St. John's, I hasten to add this is in the model, is shown in. Um, is shown in blue. So you can see there's a very good correspondence between them, skill of 77%. And again, we see a very similar relationship as we did in the Ockham model of a, um, about a two sphere drop, um, sorry, a two centimetre increase in sea level associated with a, um, a one sphere drop decrease in the strength of the overturning. 
These are the large-scale patterns of... Um, so this is the correlation between the, the sea level at St. John's and the bottom pressure and sea level. So we can see, again, this pattern very similar to the one we saw in Ockham of a coherent mode along the, um, along the continental shelf here, and very, very constrained by the, um, by the, by the um, edge, of the, uh, edge of the shelf. And we see a, a pattern here, similar, again, to what we saw in Ockham with a, a coherent pattern along the shelf down to about 30 degrees north, and then extending into the deeper part of the ocean. So, <coughs> One good thing about St. John's, it's a very long tide gauge record, so we can now start to bring some observations back into the picture. <coughs> Unfortunately, the, the agreement between the model and the observation, this is, this is the actual sea level at St. John's, um, corrected for the invert, inverted barometer response, um, and this is what we see in the model ORCA. So you can see that the model just does not capture most of the... Um, the, the higher I say higher frequency, but it's it, the, the higher part of the interannual spectrum. It doesn't, it doesn't account for any of that. But you can see, um, it, I don't think it's really my imagination, but there is an overall a slowly downward, downward trend from the 1960s to the mid, to mid part of, um, to, well, to about 1980, and then an increase just as you see in the, um, in the model. So it's almost like the model is a very sluggish version of reality. That's the way I like to think of it. So here we see that actually, this is now um, decadal variability, so I've applied a 10-year moving average um, window to this, these time series. So you can see the, um, both the observations and the models show a gradual de decrease in sea level, which would correspond to an increase in strength of the overturning. Not by very much, by only by about um, uh, maybe a surge up and a half, up until maybe the low, the low point in sea level, according to observations, is just before 1980, and then a, a, an increase. And what seems to happen in the model, the model gets the decrease, but it's slower to, re to respond, and then it's, it takes longer to climb back up again. So basically, this suggests that there has possibly been, uh, from 1960s onwards, a gradually increase in strength of the overturning, and then a, gra a gradual decrease again from 1980, or before 1980, up into 2004. So I'll just look at now just at the, um, the reconstruction for um, Itaparica in Brazil. Um, again, this is, this is the, um, the actual is shown in red and the reconstruction is in blue. One of the interesting things here is you, see, you do see quite a, um, a, some quite large changes in the south which do not appear in the north. So it questions the idea of the MSC as being some sort of coherent overall moving um, body. <laughs> but again, we see very high skill, 73%. And here we now see a different relationship. Of course, we'd expect the sign to be different because F, the sign of F, has changed as we've gone across the equator. <clears throat> These are the patterns, the correlation, this is the bottom pressure correlation, so we can see here a very nice um, um, shelf following pattern similar to what we saw in um, the North Atlantic. And this is a, um, a bit more of a messy pattern, correlation pattern of sea level. One interesting thing is, even though there are differences between the North and the South, there is um, part of the circulation, as you would expect, which is coherent, coherent from the south to the north. That being the case, um, and taking it that sea level, um, that's manifested itself in sea level on the eastern boundary of both North and South America, we'd expect to see an anti-correlation in the sea level between the north and the south associated with the coherent mode of variability. And actually, you do see in the bottom pressure pattern um, this, this here. So we see high pressure on here, uh, corresponding to the increase in strength of the overturning, and we see sea level going down here in the, in the north, as we'd expect. So that, that hints at, a, um, in spite of the fact that there's, well, the variability at any one latitude, I think, is a mixture of a coherent mode, which is seen, seen reflected in this pattern, and then more localised features. <clears throat> uh, that's just um, basically a zoom in to have a closer look at this pattern. So this is the um, tie gauge location, and this is the range where it accounts for most of the variance in the strength of the overturning. And we can see just more closely now this very nice relationship between the correlation pattern in bottom pressure and um, how it's constrained by topography. That, that white contour, I don't know if you can quite see it there, that corresponds to a depth of 2,000 metres. So just to summarise, um, <clears throat> Models, all the models I've looked at now, and I think I've looked at quite a range of models, enough to be able to be confident that most models will um, show that interannual fluctuations in the strength of overturning are primarily reflected in pressure 
on the western boundary of the Atlantic. Um, so either all models are doing something really wrong, or this is what really happens. And if we want to, um, if we're interested in adrenal variations in the strength of the overturning, we can look at pressure on the western boundary. Of course, as Chris said, measuring pressure is, is, is a challenge that we can't, we can't do yet. So if we had um, one of the mythical non-drifting bottom pressure recorders, we could throw it into the, onto the continental shelf and um, pretty well reconstruct the overturning circulation. But um, we can't do that yet because we don't have the, the technology. But um, <clears throat> of course, we do have sea level. And given that you'd expect there to be um, a, a strong relationship between well, there is a strong relationship between sea level and bottom pressure in shallower waters. We can expect there to be a close relationship between the strength of the overturning on adrenal timescales and sea level along the east and um, eastern coast of both North and South America. This is what we do see in the model. Um, the observations aren't there to, to show that that's what happens in reality yet. Um, <clears throat> There's quite a nice simple relationship really in that a two centimetre increase in sea level or, um, is, corresponds to a, a one square drop decrease in the strength of the overturning. Um, <clears throat> that seems to be robust between models as well. Um, <clears throat> with that relationship, we can construct transport at 50 degrees north with a skill of 77% using St. John's tide gauge. So that suggest that if you're interested in looking at long-term variations in the overturning, we should focus on, on the St. John's tide gauge, or of course, you know, bringing more tide gauges into the picture obviously will, in, will increase our knowledge. <clears throat> and then if we look at the south, we can reconstruct 73% 70 of the scale of the intraangular variations in the overturning strength using the tide gauge that, uh, I'm going to say this for one last time, Ita Parika. So if anyone actually doesn't know how to pronounce that, come and see me afterwards. So um, I'm not sure if this, is a, uh, if this is actually one of the ones. I, I looked at the data here, and there's not a lot of data, so I don't know if it's a, if it's a tide gauge which is um, not being used anymore, but it does suggest that it would be quite an interesting one to um, focus some attention on. So that's it. Thank you.